Amen. In Luke chapter 2, Luke the physician wrote probably one of the most detailed accounts of the birth of Christ. And it starts off and it says, About that time Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. This was the first census when Quirinius was governor. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to be accounted for. So Joseph went from the Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judah, David's town, for the census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiancée, who was pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the hostel or inn. There were sheep herders camping in the neighborhood, and they had set night watches over their sheep. Suddenly God's angel stood among them, and God's glory blazed around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has just been born in David's town, a Savior who is Messiah and Master. That is what you're to look for, a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once, the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights, peace to all men and women on earth who please him. And as the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the sheep herders talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. And all who heard the sheep herders were impressed. And Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear, deep within herself. The sheep herders returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they had been told. What a marvelous story. Mankind's greatest gift that we could ever hope for, that we could ever dream of, that we could ever imagine came from the greatest giver and was rejected by most and still is today. John tells us that Jesus came to his own people and even they rejected him. It's as if the world put the present back under the tree or wrote on the envelope, return to sender. The truth is that Jesus' life was one marked by rejection. He was rejected by the innkeeper. There was no room for him. So he was born in a feeding trough. In a, in, a, in a barn for animals. He was rejected as illegitimate growing up in Nazareth, addressed as the son of Mary by his neighbors instead of the traditional son of Joseph. He was rejected by the Jewish religious leaders for teaching grace over law. He was betrayed by Judas and rejected by the other disciples who all ran from him in his darkest hour. And he even felt rejected by God himself when he was hanging on the cross. When he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For many people here tonight, Christmas can be painful. Because it reminds you of strained relationships in your lives. It reminds you of where you thought you would be. It reminds you of the stress of getting ready for this holiday, of never having enough money, and you're under that pressure to take care of everyone, and you want everyone to be wooed and odd, by the, but, but you don't have enough money to go around. Everyone understands and relates to that. You come tonight maybe a little stressed because if you're like me, I went out today to do some last-minute things, and I need to get saved all over again. I think I lost it somewhere on Montauk Highway and somewhere over there. I don't know. It was crazy, man. I, I, it was crazy.
Everyone in this room has been rejected at one point or another, and you know the pain of that. You know the hurt of that. And the great news is that God understands that. And he cares about that. He cares about the fact that you might be hurting tonight. God knew ahead of time that his gift would be rejected. And yet, he gave it anyway. 700 years earlier, the prophet Isaiah predicted this. He said in Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected, speaking of Jesus, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. And we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. God knew that his greatest gift to us would be rejected, and he gave it anyway. And that is the good news of the gospel. That while we were sinners, while we were at our worst, Christ died for us. You don't have to get cleaned up to take a bath. You just jump in dirty, right? The irony is, is that this one that we're just reading about that was rejected by many and was acquaint, had deepest grief and was acquainted with sorrows. And the, the, the irony is, is that this Jesus accepted people as they were. He never rejected anyone. In fact, he befriended and he accepted people who were rejected by society. He accepted the lepers who lived on the outskirts of town because they had been rejected by Jewish society. They were unclean, and no one was supposed to touch them. And yet we see Jesus touching them and praying with them and healing them. Jesus accepted the Samaritan woman, who he really had no right to speak to at the well. And yet he spoke to her and listened to her heart and told her everything there was to know about her life. And she went back and, and, and told everyone in her town, come meet a man that's told me everything about my life. She had a reputation for being that kind of woman. that you just She had many relationships. And yet Jesus didn't reject her. I love the story of the woman caught in adultery. She was guilty. Scripture never tries to gloss that over. She was guilty. She did it. Jesus told her something very powerful. He said, woman, I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. And I think so many times in Christianity, we want to tell people, if you go and sin no more, then we won't condemn you. Jesus did the very opposite. Didn't reject anybody. Jesus accepted sinners and tax collectors who had been rejected by the religious leaders to be unfit or to be around. And he ate with them and laughed with them and dined and reclined with them and probably told jokes with them. He loved hanging around with the outcasts. And we read that Jesus accepted the little children who were often treated as a nuisance in that day. He welcomed them and had held them in his arms, and they sat on his lap. This man who was rejected never rejected anyone, and he won't reject you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how much you've blown it. He'll never turn his back on you. He'll never reject you. And, and, and it goes beyond just accepting because this Jesus who accepted all of us then gave his life, laid his life down as a sacrifice for us so that we could be reunited with a holy God, that our sins could be forgiven, that we could have eternal life. He did all of that for you and I. Now, not everyone rejected him, and not everyone today rejects him. In fact, John says, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. And that word accepted literally means 
to take home. To take home. So, in other words, believing the gospel and, and receiving and accepting what, you, what, what Jesus has given to you, you are taking him home, welcoming him into your heart of hearts, bringing him home. So tonight, regardless of whether you feel accepted or rejected by people in your life, the good news is this, is that the birth of Jesus shows us once and for all that God has accepted us as we are. But I'm glad it doesn't stop there because um, that would be kind of depressing. He not only accepts us as we are, but He wants to transform us and change us and make us brand new and, and conform us into His image. He loves you all the time for all time. When I look at the very manner of his birth, even, turned away from the inn because there was no room. Um, he was born in that feeding trough. It, it's a clear invitation to the rejected and to the abused and to the mistreated and to the forgotten and to the overlooked and to the lost to come to him to find eternal life. See, the reality is, is that I would probably be a little intimidated to fly across the pond and drive up to Windsor Castle and try to meet the king or queen. It's a queen right now, but the queen or a king. Or to drive to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and try to walk up the front entrance. Actually, that wouldn't work out too well. But it would be intimidating to go into our nation's uh, White House and meet the president. It would be intimidating to all of us. It would be intimidating to approach a throne like that. But I'm not afraid to approach a stable with a baby in a feeding trough. I'm not afraid of that. If Jesus had been born in the Waldorf Astoria in the city, probably the rich and famous would feel welcome and at home with him. But since he was born in a stable, all of the outsiders of the world would instinctively feel a kinship with Him. See, the best gifts that you could ever give anyone celebrates relationships. Sometimes it's cheaper to buy an expensive gift than it is to restore a broken relationship. God's answer for the world's problem, the sin problem and all of its problems, has never been material things not to give us more stuff, but to give us more of Himself. Could we stand for just a moment? And um, I'd like to just close this part out in prayer. We're going to sing one more song. We're going to get you out of here. I know you got a lot of things going on, parties and family things. And Remember, there's no calories at all for the next two days. None. Just go for it. Go big or go home. Or get big when you're home. I don't know, what it, whatever it is. I don't know. We're going to have a Jane Fonda aerobics workout class next week on Thursday nights. So some of you young people have no idea what I'm talking about. You don't know who Jane Fonda is. No, you know who she is. Okay. Um, listen, my friend, I, I, I don't know where you're at in your walk with God. I don't know where you're at in your spiritual life. But I'd like to offer you the greatest gift that I could ever have the privilege of offering you, and that's eternal life, that's salvation. It's not me, it's, it's, it's Jesus. I want to offer you Jesus tonight. And so I'm going to close in prayer, and um, man, if you're here, and that's you, and you're like, man, something in my heart's crying out for a relationship with my Creator, I just want you to pray this with me. Just, just bow your heads, just quietly, just, I want you to pray, I want you to agree with me, I want you to pray with me as we pray, and just my prayer tonight is that you walk out of here with the greatest gift that mankind has ever seen or experienced, and that's the gift of salvation. So, dear Lord, I just come before you tonight, God. I thank you for bringing us here tonight and reminding us of this incredible miracle of the birth of the Messiah. And tonight, we say, God, please come into our lives 
and forgive us of all of our sin. I invite you to to step up onto the throne of my life. I'm going to step down and invite you to step on it, Lord, and begin to lead my life and to guide me. And Lord, I will follow you wherever you take me. I pray, God, you would fill all the emptiness in my heart. Fill it with your glory, with your presence, God. Bring transformation to my life. I pray that you would give a hope and a future that, that tonight, God, we would know that my soul is right with you. It's not because I deserve it. It's not because I've, I've earned it. It's because of this wonderful gift of mercy and grace. We receive it tonight. Change us, oh God. In Jesus' wonderful name.